Hi, Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company, coming to you from upstage left at the Highfield Theatre. Welcome to Backstage, a week in review of work being done by our talented design and production students. Let's see what they've been working on. This week, the design and production team worked independently on self-driven creative projects intended to showcase their skills without being constrained to the limits of what we consider theater. Their only parameter was that they had to create a physically constructed piece. I suggested they think of something practical or maybe something that could be displayed in a museum or art gallery. In any case, they came up with a lot of different types of art. They were inspired by a lot of different things. They pushed the limits of what they're able to do and I want you to take a look at what they've created. We're also gonna share a bit from their most recent workshop. Scenic designer John Lee Beatty and prop supervisor Buse Bigley return, along with special surprise guest costume designer Jennifer von Meyerhauser, to look at the students' portfolios and resumes and give them feedback from a professional standpoint. This is the first of two workshops in which the students will be working on improving their portfolio materials. So Jennifer is a friend of mine, but a colleague for both, everything. But uh, we've worked together since 1970. Since the beginning. What? Since the <laughs> since beginning the of beginning. time. But Jennifer also, every single one of you has seen Jennifer's work. Jennifer designed Law and Order. So you, those people didn't walk in off the street looking like that. That's costume design, <laughs> believe me. So yeah. Jennifer did Law and Order and the FBI recently. So you've seen her work, I promise you. And you people who are uh, like, uh, what is a cult movie favorite? She did The Hand That Rocks the Cradle too. <laughs> but and Jennifer- son, Captain Ron is a big cult favorite. Oh, Captain Ron, right. People <laughs> dress up like Captain Ron. People still write to me about how to get this. <laughs> wow. But Jennifer is actually, I know her as a, a stage, uh, stage designer of costumes and uh, she does Broadway, off Broadway regional theater, and then of course film and television, sort of the secret weapon of the theater. <laughs> I think you're typecast for doing uh, exactly making people just look natural, right? I mean, that's well, it, the clothes are very classic, so they don't look um, dated. Yeah, I was watching Law and Order the other day, and you couldn't actually tell what year it was, which was rather clever because of obviously we're going to see it for the rest of our lives <laughs> yeah yeah i wasn't aware of that when i was doing it i just tried to be true to the characters but you know and you uh jennifer also taught it <laughs> you taught it you taught at brandeis for how long yeah. 20 years 20 years okay before we get started though i i, I think everybody who turn has a resume and a portfolio and that's all of you um <clears throat> you need to imagine the person or company that you are presenting it to. And if, for example, with someone my age, I, I have an AOL, you know, so you know how old I am. Uh, <laughs> but some of, you know, the, the easier you make it for the person receiving it, the better it is. But I also want to add, and this is a general note for all the ones I read, some of you have been doing many different things. You know, you're not in, in my head, you're not in school anymore. So uh, there's no law against writing a different resume for the job that's being offered. You know, if you're looking for a design job, I think Jennifer would be the first one to tell you that she never admits that she can sew. But, uh, uh, but yeah. depending on the job you're looking for, you want to re you probably want to rewrite your resume, especially at your point in life, rewrite the resume so that you have the resume of what they're looking for. And the rest of it can be listed as other skills and all that. Um, well, first of all, I think that's great advice because I know <laughs> even for me, and, and believe it or not, I still go on interviews. So I always try to personalize perhaps my resume or also how I present myself for each particular interview or actually, you know, in the film business now, all of our interviews are done um, like this electronically, even before the virus. So, and you put your work and it's on there. 
But anyway, I always think it's most important to personalize it and, 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 and to, to agree with John. But also, when I was looking at some of your resumes, and it is great that they're all on one page, but I don't know if this is my attention ability, but if there's too many clutter of different things, I think it's good to separate, you know, because, so people can glance at it and see, you know, very quickly what you have to offer. And you also don't want to have, uh, you probably don't have this problem, but you don't uh, want to have too many things in your portfolio because people's attention spans are short. Very you, want to, you want to hit them, you're better off hitting them with five things than hitting them with 20. Also, may I add, if you're coming out of school, I thought when I first showed my portfolio that I had to show everything I did, and did whether I thought it was good or not, which is a school, head trip but you know as I say you're not being graded anymore so you I don't have to keep a record of something that sucks you know so yeah. they're all winners <laughs> they're all the ones that are left are all winners <laughs> they only see what you show them they exactly. don't know about anything else so again you know if you personalize it in terms of who you're seeing but also you know you only have to show them what you think is you'd like or, to the classic thing with directors is they go through looking at your sketches or photos and stuff because they are looking for something in their mind and they're hoping that you've got the a, a set design similar to what they're looking for you know see that when we do this on um, online now we don't know when they get bored so but in, yeah. when you, <laughs> you think they could just turn it off after three and we'd never know so maybe that's good. But um, when I used to show my portfolio physically, I could always tell when they were getting bored and I had to try to figure out a way. Most sort of meet and greets in television and film are totally done on Skype. Something from a, a, a props perspective, uh, someone told me when I was in college and it was really good advice, is like take as many photos as you can. And like when I was in college, uh, there wasn't a camera on everybody's phone. Um, but still, like process shots when you're making um, when you're making anything. Like if you can show me the process and how you got to the end result, I learned so much more. That's true in scenic art too. If you can, if you could, sh if you are ever painting one thing by yourself in scenic art work, if you can take uh, you know five pictures, uh, as we just said, five pictures of process that tells so much more than showing. 20 fabulous things in one shot, the process thing. Somebody had a carpentry thing and I was like, oh yeah, this person's been around tools. You know, I thought, this is good. You know, this is good. For this week's solo creative project, I wanted to make a miniature dress form that I could use for future projects. I found a pattern in line and I could, here I am cutting it out. And I wanted to make it slightly larger than the original pattern, so I traced each pattern piece, added one inch to every side, and then cut out the pieces again. I ironed each pattern piece with a towel over it so they wouldn't be damaged. I then began looking at my fabric and sizing and planned the layout and then cut each piece from the fabric that I chose. Um, I chose the wrong side of this fabric to create a contrast for the side pieces. I then folded down the top edges of the neck pieces, pin them together, sewed the top shoulders, then the side pieces in. I clipped all threads and trimmed the edges, cut out the felt pieces and the cardboard piece, and then I began to stuff it with cotton balls. I used cotton balls because they're cheaper and more available than regular polyfill stuffing.
started, I hot glued the cardboard piece into the bottom and then hot glued the felt piece over the edges and then I hot glued it to a toothbrush stand and then I began stitch sides for for some shaping and I worked on shaping it a little bit by hand and sewed across the front to make the waist a little bit more prominent. I covered a pom-pom with fabric and put it in the top to finish it off. I then cut out another felt piece. I wanted to do this because where I had originally glued the toothbrush stand to the bodice didn't look very nice and I wanted this to have a clean finish on the bottom. While I was hot gluing, my cat Sally came to give me some assistance in the final step of this project. Here's the final product, and I'm happy with how it turned out with the resizing and the materials that I used. While it's not perfect, I think it will do for some fun projects for the rest of the summer and possibly further into the future. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this fun little project, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Alport, the scenic crew of uh, 2020 Clock Company. So today I'm going to be building a cornhole set. We call this Clock Cornhole. So a few things that you're going to need. You're going to need some power tools. You're going to need an impact driver, a two-speed drill. You're going to need a 
jigsaw and you're gonna need a circular saw. All right, let's get to it. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor, and for this week's project, I decided to do a Viking fur mantle. I've always been super into ancient civilizations, especially the Vikings, and I've had this concept for a Viking Renfair outfit for a few months, and I figured it was about time to get started on it. I had no idea whether I wanted to pattern it or not, so I just kind of went for it. I decided to just hack away, but the piece that I cut was way too long. So, I measured out about like a foot and a half. I don't exactly know how much because my see through ruler I had ordered without paying attention to the measurement type. So, I'm pretty sure it's in centimeters, it's in the metric measurement. But uh, here it is after the cut on both sides, and it looked a little better. We were getting there, but it still wasn't exactly what I wanted. So I put it on my mannequin slash dress form and hacked away at it again, this time making more of a round, almost like a neck pillow shape. This didn't take very long at all. Um, yeah, but there it is on the dress form. I'm just kind of fiddling with it. And then I put it on and it draped pretty well on me. It's definitely not even, but this is meant to resemble sort of an animal pelt. So what I did from here was I basically combed out all of the synthetic looking matting of the fabric because it looked very fake to me and I didn't really like it. And I started cutting up in the direction of the hair. I learned the strategy from cutting my own hair and if you can see here, included a one side was the finished side and then the other was the unfinished side and you can kind of see a difference here at the halfway point that I included. I had learned the strategy from cutting my hair for years because I have curly hair and I figured it was just easier to start cutting my hair. So yeah. Here's where I started distressing it. Uh, so I had already done a test piece and I was originally gonna do white wolf fur, which has like speckles of black and brown, 
but then I ended up really liking how my test fabric looked by the end. So I just decided to go for it. And basically this is a mix of acrylic paint and alcohol, rubbing alcohol. And I started using my fingers, which I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do, but oh well, it looks nice. And I went back and forth with just straight acrylic and then watering it down with the rubbing alcohol, which was a mix of paint and rubbing alcohol. I'm going back and forth and brushing it out and then blow drying it. And yeah. So while we watch me do this for quite some time, let me give you some Viking facts. First, did you know that the Norse were actually very clean and orderly? In fact, the Vikings actually bathed once a week and actively combed out their hair, which was an oddity back then. The Anglo-Saxon men used to get really upset <laughs> because the Anglo women were significantly more attracted to the Norse men because of their cleanliness. This is the halfway point. Um, is, as you can see, I made a lot of progress. And I was really happy with how it looked so far, so. So these are close-ups of the final product. I was super duper happy with how this looked, especially after seeing the comparison of like my, my scrap fabric versus the mantle that I had finished. Yeah, just to give you kind of a perspective, that's what it looks like on my shoulders and from a distance. Then this is what the original fabric looked like. You can really see kind of how fake it looks versus, you know, my hard work. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy. Thank you for joining. Hi everybody, my name is Thomas J. Charles and I am one of the costumers on the design and production team. When I was told that I could create whatever I wanted, I knew that I wanted to design and build a full costume piece. I developed my uh, design process actually when I was studying abroad in London in the spring, uh, working on classical text. So a lot of what I do is rooted in the way that an actor would analyze a Shakespeare piece. So I knew that I wanted to do a Shakespeare and I actually chose King Lear because King Lear was the play that Shakespeare wrote while he was in quarantine during the bubonic plague during the Middle Ages. So I figured, you know, what better piece to do while we we're all at home quarantining yet again. The character that I decided to design a costume for was the Earl of Kent. And this costume is specifically the disguise that he wears from act one, scene four, all the way through the end of the show. Prior to this scene, the Earl of Kent was just banished from the kingdom by King Lear. And he is now uh, attempting to regain the king's trust in disguise and become one of his one of his knaves um, and eventually win the king over again. After reading a script, my first step is to go scene by scene and answer all of Stanislavski's seven questions for actors for each scene for each character. So I, for the Earl of Kent, I was thinking about who this person was, where are they, when was it, what they wanted, why they wanted it, how they were gonna get it, and what's in their way. And all of those pieces are elements that went in to influence the costume. Two of the questions that Stanislavski asked that I really responded to were the questions of what does the character want and why does the character want it? And those were two of the things that really fueled my design. I decided that the Earl of Kent wants to, the king to make him his servant in order to gain the king's trust as someone he's not while he's in his disguise so that eventually he could reveal himself and have that ha ha moment and um, reveal that he was this person that the king was trusting and he was somebody that he banished and make the king realize the error in his ways. So I decided that the Earl was in disguise was somebody that the king instantly needed to feel a connection to, he instantly needed to feel that trust bond, but also was somebody that 
there was something quite, you know those people that there's something slightly off about them, but you're not really sure what it is? That's kind of what I wanted to create with this character's costume piece. I also wanted to emphasize that the Earl of Kent is most often delivering facts when he speaks. That's a lot of what his lines are. They're just relaying, it's relaying information. But different characters receive that information differently depending on their background and their bias and everything that makes up their personality. And just because of the climate that we're in right now, that really reminded me of how people feel when they watch the news. Some people are in denial, some people are angry, some people are overjoyed, and there's a range of emotions. The other piece um, that I connected, I decided connected a lot to the news about this character was the feeling of, of distrust. There's a lot of that with, you know, the term fake news and people either refuse to believe some things or don't know what to believe. And I really think there was a parallel there with not only with this character, but with the show in general. So I wanted, I decided that I was gonna make this costume piece out of newspaper. And I decided on this bomber jacket silhouette because I wanted to make something that was modern and contemporary, but also had some Elizabethan flair. What I love about Shakespeare is that because it was a play for the people, I really feel like you can really set it wherever it, wherever you want, wherever a director feels like it's gonna be the most effective. So I decided to bring it into 2020 to make it something that you might wear. Initially, I wanted to do a puffer style quilted jacket, and that's initially how I um, how I rendered it. I wanted to take inspiration from the Elizabethan doublet and the shape at the bottom hem and the shape of the shoulder and then the shape of the shirt, uh, the shirt sleeve that would come out from underneath, just the way that that puffed. I really thought that added a really nice contrast to the structure of the rest of the garment. And then I translated that into a modern puffer jacket silhouette because I wanted to create something that looked interesting and was sort of eye-catching and one of a kind, something that you would notice on the street. Uh, but upon looking at it, realized that it was just a puffer jacket. That's, I think, what this character is calling out for in terms of his costume, something that is eye-catching and it's makes you look at him, but then you realize that there's, it's, it's not, it's a lot simpler than you thought it was. But maybe an hour and a half later, you're, you're still thinking about this, about this piece. You're still thinking about this person that you saw walking down the street in this bomber. When I started building, I used almost an entire Philadelphia Inquirer to make, uh, as my fabric, to make this jacket. I wanted to stay away from the highly colored inks. I wanted to use a lot of the text, a lot of the black ink on the sort of off-white paper to create the jacket. I used a pattern for a hoodie to create to as a basis to cut out all of the different pieces um, and then I did actually expand the sleeve to create some volume to bring that nod to Elizabethan fashion into the jacket and I was going to put um, a little bit of batting and do that puffer quilting on it but it was gonna become way too stiff I had to bend that idea and I went just with the, um, just with this sort of bomber jacket aesthetic. Everything in the jacket is sewn. The body of the jacket, so not the arms, is completely machine sewn on there, but I did have to hand stitch the sleeves and the collar on because they wouldn't flip in the same way that you would be able to put fabric right sides together, sew it on the machine and then flip it because paper, crinkles it's a lot thicker when paper had a, this paper had a lot more volume to it than uh an equivalent fabric piece would fabric you can just sort of cram under the machine and move it where you need it to whereas this paper was going to rip or or crease or or wrinkle um and not hold the shape that i wanted it to but i'm really really happy with the way that it turned out i did a great little photo shoot with my sister if i were to do this differently if i were to do this again Knowing what I know now, I know that newspaper really doesn't have the same capability as fabric does. And I probably would think about adapting a pattern more than I did. So it, rather than just 
taking a pattern designed for fabric and tracing it onto newspaper and then expanding the sleeve, I'd probably rethink it and figure out how I can embrace the structure and the challenges that newspaper presents to create a jacket. And this is probably one of my favorite things that I've ever made, especially since I actually got it onto a person. I was really, really happy about that. Hello everyone, my name's Maddie Boshin and for this week's project I decided to make an 1890s late Victorian hat inspired by the work of Edmund Tarbell. So he is a painter from Boston. Um, this work on the right, my sister Lydia, is actually displayed in the MFA. Some of you may have seen it before. So I was really inspired by his paintings. Um, they all feature really beautiful, impressionistic art, um, and he paints a lot of hats as well as peonies, and so I really took my inspiration from both of those things. This painting here, called On Boston's Hill from 1901, is where I took most of my inspiration for this particular project. I really liked how loose his painting style was, as well as the color scheme. It was very summery to me, and I love the huge white flowers on top of her head. So here are some of his peony paintings, um, as well as some of the research that I started to do. These websites all came in handy. This Edwardian hat tutorial, um, this page from a magazine from 1899, um, Beauty from Ashes blog with the wireframe hat tutorial, um, as well as the vintage Victorian 1890s dress collection. Personally, I had never made a hat before, so this all came in handy to try and figure out how to do so. So this here is the pattern that I made for after taking measurements of my head. Um, I transferred them onto paper, and this is what I came up with. So as you can see here, I'm using the pattern pieces I created to cut the pieces out in buckram. And yes, I was using rocks as pattern weights because I didn't have any, but they did work just as well as pattern weights would have. So the next step was to stitch the wire into the buckram pieces along the edge. I had to go very slow in order to not break a needle on my sewing machine. Um, but this is the result of that, and this will give the hat some stiffness so it stays upright. The step after that was to cut my patterns out in fashion fabric, or the fabric for the outside of the hat, as well as the lining. I chose to recycle and use some fabric that used to be my mom's old curtains that she gave me. Um, I then had to stitch this to all the pieces and cover them all as neatly as I possibly could. There was a lot of hand stitching for this project. For the lining along the inside of the brim, I knew I wanted to put some lace gathered down. Um, and at first I tried muslin as a lining under that and I quickly decided that I needed something um, a little fancier, so I chose uh, a nice white satin. Here you can see me fiddling with the gathers of the satin in order to make them lay nicely before I stitch them down. I did this to the lace as well and then stitched down the lace to keep it in place, leaving the edge of the lace that was scalloped along the brim sticking out a little for decoration. So here's the result of all that. I then had to stitch together all the pieces um, through many layers of buckram and fabric in order to assemble the hat together. And this is what the final product looked like before adding decoration. So here's a little clip of me adding the flowers. It was really just a matter of cutting the pieces I want and ordering and reordering them um, in a way that I thought fit the research that I did. Overall, this project was so much fun. Um, it's the first hat I've ever made and I'm definitely excited to get to try again. Not everything went perfect, but um, it was a lot of fun and I definitely learned a lot about 
how hats are constructed. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed this, and you will see me next week.
every menu, commercial, or similar types of advertisements for restaurants, you will see photographs of the individual dishes that you can order. These photographs are very particular because the subjects of the pictures have to look like the most delectable and appetizing morsels of the individual type of food they are. And due to this, it can take hours to get the perfect shot. This requires prop food or non-edible food lookalikes that will stay intact after a long photo shoot and potentially even have the longevity to be used for multiple photo shoots. Prop food is hyper-realistic, detail-oriented, and most importantly has to be the most convincing imposter of the real deal. Prop food can be used for film, theater, and decoration, and what I wanted to focus on advertising. I was drawn to creating an ice cream sundae because of the fun summer ties ice cream has, but especially because how many different components go into creating the treat. An ice cream sundae is customizable and has the opportunity to include a myriad of different toppings as well as flavors. I was also drawn to the challenge of the hyperrealism of the project because I'm a very detail-oriented person who has some perfectionist tendencies, so striving and researching different methods onto how to make the most realistic ice cream sundae I could was a delight. My ultimate goal was to convince people People that my Sunday was real and after sending pictures to my friends and family members who needed to be convinced that they were fake, one saying that mine looked more appetizing than the real deal and others getting a craving for ice cream after looking at my picture, I believed my Sundays would be a success as an advertiser.
My name is Katie Moran and this week for our self-directed project we were told to do something that we have never done before and we've always wanted to try and so I decided to take on the task of creating my first ever model for a set. I have never built a model before for anything I don't think. <laughs> so I decided to do what a lot of professional set designers do which is they make a model of the set that they're designing so that people have a good idea of what the set is going to look like when it's actually made on stage. So I picked a show and this is how it went. <laughs> so the play that I decided to design a set for is called Picnic by William Ings. And I chose this play because I read it this past semester at school during our section of our modern drama class that was talking about naturalistic theater. Naturalism is a type of theater that attempts to create an illusion of reality through a range of dramatic and theatrical strategies. And what this means is that what's on stage is supposed to feel real. It's supposed to feel like something that you could actually see in your everyday life in order to make a more realistic environment during the play. And here's my finished inspiration board. I found other productions of this play to see what type of housing and what type of styles the houses were when other people designed this show. I noticed a lot of pastel colors, very realistic housing styles, windows, doors, very simple though, nothing too extravagant. It's supposed to look like a normal backyard that you or I could see in any day. And they live normal everyday lives, so I wanted their houses to really reflect who they were. And this is my finished sketch of what I wanted my set to look like in the end. I wanted it to look like a nice backyard that two households shared. And going through the script, I noticed that a window is needed for one of the characters to talk through at some point. There needed to be a log shed for another character to use. And doors needed to be very accessible, but also be able to be seen from every point in the audience. So I put them in places that I thought would be best for them. And here's where I began the construction part of my process. I use just simple drawing paper, my mechanical pencil, a ruler, and a lot of cardboard. This was a very tedious process, especially since this was my first time, but I also challenged myself to try and draw this to scale of what an actual stage would be. So I kind of based it off of my college's main stage, which is kind of square-like, and I worked from there making everything the size that it technically would be on a scale model. I worked in a fourth inch scale, so every door was a three by six, windows were mostly two by four, sometimes I made them a little shorter to fit where I wanted them to go. I wanted to make sure that the porches technically had enough space for people to act on them, so I made them about four or five feet wide based off of my own porch measurements actually. <laughs> Here's me working on what is easily one of the most detailed and stressful parts of this process but also the most satisfying part. I'm cutting out the railings and making sure the railings actually work. It was just so cool to see them come together. I honestly wasn't even sure if they were gonna actually stand up but when they did I just felt so accomplished and I think they actually came out pretty cute. 
And now at this point, I wasn't actually going to paint my set, but I decided that, you know, if I was going to do this project, I really just had to finish strong. So I decided to go ahead and paint the whole set. I wasn't going to just because I had seen professional models be done with just simply the shapes of what they wanted the set to be. But I'm the type of person that just likes to finish the project and do it to the best of my ability. So I felt like painting had to be involved with it. And this is what my model ended up looking like. I, I love it. I think it's so cute. You'll notice that instead of cutting out a tree, I painted a tree because <laughs> I didn't want to put myself through that much of a process. I think the houses look really nice together. I think they look like houses that would have been built next to each other. I really like the colors. We have the door, we have the porch for acting space. I think there's a lot of nice playing room in the front. This house in particular has the window open for the actress to use during one of the first scenes of the play. Here is my secret for fantastic stage lighting on a model. And that about wraps it up. I hope you all enjoyed watching me go through this process. I really enjoyed experiencing this process. It gave me a lot of insight and helped me learn a lot more about what to do and how to make this for future projects that I may be put on. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all next week. Backstage is part of our larger programming Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible by a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another installment of Backstage. Backstage.